السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيبا مباركا في كما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد Thank you guys for joining me this afternoon or this evening الحمد لله as we continue reading from the book Guardianship in Islam, expounding on the essential obligations, conditions, and responsibilities of the wali in Islam. All right, very, very important material here uh, for the brothers as well as for the sisters, more importantly for the sisters, but for the brothers as well to, to take benefit from this, inshallah. Okay, so um, in our last discussion, we're still reading from chapter one, um, which is uh, the the title of the chapter is Guardianship, a Prerequisite for the Validity of Marriage. Guardianship, a Prerequisite for the Validity of Marriage. Okay. So we stopped off on page uh, 62. So we're talking about sisters who are new converts to Islam who run into the problem of not having a Muslim male representative from their family. They don't have they're the only Muslim in their family. All right. And there are a lot of sisters who unfortunately not unfortunately, but, um, you know. Jazakallah um, khair, maktaba to Imam Shokani. I mean, I mean to your dua and, and to you as well. Jazakumallah khairan. Much appreciated, brother. Um, shukran, jazakumallah khairan. So we're talking about women who convert to Islam and don't have uh, a wali from their family. They don't have any Muslim members of their family. And this also goes to, go, this also applies to women who uh, are born and raised Muslim and don't have you know, male representation from their family for one reason or another. So we're reading from page 62. So if you have the book, please turn to page 62. All right. We're going to get deep tonight. All right. I got my coffee. I hope you got your coffee, your tea. You're ready to get deep. Not now, later. We're going to get deep tonight. So I hope you have your coffee, you have your tea with you. I hope you seated it comfortably somewhere and you're ready to engage in this very, very important topic. OK, so leadership in our current climate of excessive individualism and busy schedules filled with subpar engagements 
that hinder men from meaningful work doesn't show up in many of our communities quite the same way as it did during the time of the early Muslims. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you have imams who are just like extremely busy for some reason. I, I don't know why. I was an imam at one point in my life and there was never a time where I was extremely busy. And brothers and sisters, please stop leading with that comment when you run into an imam. Oh, imam, I know you're busy. I know you're extremely busy. No, I'm not. I'm not extremely busy. If you are imam and you are smart, you work smarter, not harder. You learn how to delegate. You learn how to you know, make people, assign people tasks that frees you up time to do other things. But this whole idea that, you know, the imam is extremely busy, extremely busy doing what? Extremely busy doing what? If you are imam and you're on the clock and you have a certain amount of time for you to discharge your duties as an imam, um, then you should be busy doing what an imam is supposed to be doing. How long does it take you to prepare a khutbah? If it's taking you three days to prepare a khutbah, that's three days is too much. Three days is too much time for imam to be preparing a khutbah. Too much. And if you need help with learning how to prepare a khutbah quicker, then you need to reach out to somebody who can assist you with that. I just gave, a, you know, just this July, I gave a seminar, a two-day seminar on how to prepare an effective khutbah. And that dealt with, you know, time, cutting your time in half, finding a topic, learning how to research the topic. And if you need help with that, then please reach out to somebody. But there is no way that it should take an imam three days to prepare a khutbah. Years ago, years ago in my, in, you know, in, in my beginning, the beginning of my journey as an imam, it used to take me three days. I would start on Wednesday searching for a topic find a topic by Wednesday night, and then start, you know, my notes. Thursday, add a little bit more to it. Sometimes I would be working on my khutbah all the way up until Friday morning, all the way up until maybe an hour or two before Jumu'ah. Unacceptable. And that was only because I didn't have somebody teach me. I didn't have somebody sit me down and explain to me or give me the tools on how to do that. That was something that I had to figure out on my own. Not to say that there weren't people out there that were proficient and efficient when it came to delivering khutbahs, but I didn't have access to them. I didn't know who they were and nobody reached out to me. They didn't make themselves accessible to me, so I had to figure it out. But today, it, it would take me literally 45 minutes to put a, prepare a khutbah. Give me any topic, any topic, 45 minutes or less to prepare a khutbah. Uh, for those of you who are on Instagram, is the is the Instagram going in and out, or is that someone else? Is that a person's particular um, Instagram? I just want to make sure that it's before I start the thing over that everybody is having the same experience. For those of you who are on Instagram, is the Instagram going in and out? Is it slow or going in and out? I need to know before I turn it off. Okay, that's the second person. Okay, so I'm going to start the Instagram over, inshallah. I don't know what's happening. I'll start it over. Okay, give me a second. Okay, so going back to my point is that leadership in our current climate, you know, of excessive individualism, you know, everybody is kind of, you know, worried about themselves, focusing on themselves uh, and busy schedules filled with subpar engagements that hinder men from meaningful work 
doesn't usually show up in our communities the same way. And so I was elaborating on the fact that many imams, when you run into them, they're always super busy. They're always super busy, you know, extremely busy. And we kind of feed into that when we meet imams and we say, you know, oh, imam, you know, I have a question. I know you're extremely busy, right? No, that why, why is the imam extremely busy? What does the imam have going on in the time that is allotted for him to be the imam? What does he have going on that makes him extremely busy? That he can't get to the real work. And the real work in many of the Muslim communities, especially amongst the African Americans, is tending, is attending to those who are trying to get married. That's that's the work. I didn't realize that as an imam, I didn't realize that until I got into it and I started to see, wow, this is a full-time job. Aside from you know what other tasks an imam has. But getting people married, counseling, providing marriage counseling and, and, and imams, let me let me say something to imams. If they are listening, or those of you who have a close relationship with imams, stop tying yourself down with marriage counseling. And in many instances, the imam is not equipped is nor is he qualified to give uh, or to administer marriage counseling. In many instances, he's not qualified to do that. This is especially true if he is a graduate from one of the prestigious, you know, universities overseas, whether that is the Islamic University of Medina, Umm al Qura University in Mecca, you know, whether he studied in Yemen, he studied in Egypt, doesn't matter where he studied. In many instances, his concentration when he was studying in those universities or wherever he studied, his concentration was not in, uh, you know, marriage counseling. His concentration was in Islamic sciences. Islamic sciences, they are not they are not qualified, including myself. When I graduated, I was not qualified to do marriage counseling. And so imams have to learn how to work smarter, not harder, not burdening themselves and taking on more than what they can handle. So when a couple comes to him and they need marriage counseling, stop tying yourself down with doing marriage counseling and find someone in the community who is a clinician, who someone who is a, you know, who has a family marriage, um, um, marriage and family counseling certificate or certification or degree, find someone. And there's always one or two or three people in your community that has it. Part of being a good leader is learning how to delegate. Part of being a good leader is not taking on all the tasks that are in front of you, but learning how to delegate. Hey, I need you to counsel this couple. Hey, you you have a, a certification in family marriage and family tra training or counseling, right? Hey, I have a I have a couple who needs you know serious marriage counseling. Can you take that on for me? Can you handle that for me? Okay, great. I'm gonna give you the person's number. I'm gonna connect you guys. Alhamdulillah. That freed you up as an imam. That just bought you some time to do something else. That just bought you time to do something else. That is what it means to be a good leader. It's learning how to delegate instead of taking on everything. I spoke to an imam this past weekend and he said that he was up sometimes past his time. We're talking about way after Isha and he's sitting in his office providing marital counseling to a couple. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. That's not working smart. That's working hard, not working smart. Imams are usually the problem is is uh, to find someone who can do counseling and have knowledge of the dean. Okay, that's great. That's a great um, that's a great suggestion. And even if the person that has the marriage and family training or counseling degree doesn't have much Islamic knowledge, a lot of the times the problem that the couple is having is not necessarily connected to Islam. So in that moment, they don't necessarily need Islamic guidance in that moment. They need a clinician. They need someone who can tap into the problem. If they're having, for example, a communication breakdown, a breakdown in communication, they don't need an ayah or a hadith from the Prophet Wasallam to teach them how to communicate better. That is going to come from the clinical side of it. 
Now, the clinician can reach out to the imam and say, hey, I counseled that couple. This is what I this is what their problem is. Perhaps you can follow up with them, you know, with some Islamic knowledge to, you know, kind of put the icing on the cake. Yes, you're absolutely right that we need to learn how to compensate people as well. And that speaks to the administrative part of the masjid. Yeah, a lot of the masjids, they don't compensate the imam well. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. But change is coming, inshallah. Change is coming. So imams are usually overworked and underpaid. Overworked and underpaid and almost always overwhelmed with juggling community affairs, i.e. lectures, khutbas, janazas, fundraisers, etc., etc. Um, and it leaves them very little space, you know, to carve out a substantial amount of time to dedicate to the women who need assistance with marriage. So women are knocking on the door. Hey, I'm looking for a husband. I'm trying to get married. The imam doesn't usually have time to assist her in that process because he's boggled down with other responsibilities and tasks. As a board of administration, it is not the imam's responsibility to fund or head or head the fundraiser. That's not the imam. That should be the job of the treasurer. Understand if you have a board, three main people on the board, if you're a non-for-profit organization, the three main people on your board is number one, the president of the board. And then if you have an executive president or you have a secondary president, and then you have uh, a treasurer and you have a secretary. Those are the three main positions on a 501c3 board. All right. The treasurer's job, the treasurer's responsibility is not to look after the money, but to create other opportunities for the organization to make money. That is not the imam's job. That's not the imam's responsibility. The imam's responsibility is not to get out and organize a fundraiser and then show up and do the fundraiser lecture. The imam has to hire somebody else to do that. The masjid has to hire somebody else to do that. And in many instances, people are not going to give to the imam like they would give to somebody who's an outside speaker who came in a neutral party who was very good at, you know, and proficient at get, doing fundraisers and can raise the funds. I'm telling you from experience, I can get out and I can ask you guys to give. I might get three, three thousand, four thousand, but I can bring somebody who is a skilled fundraiser and he'll get that money. He'll get the money. 25,000, 50,000 within one night. Because in many instances, the imam is not a skilled fundraiser. Here again, that's not something they teach you in a university. Let me tell you that firsthand. That's not something that the Islamic university teaches you. That's not something that you learn at Umar Qura University. That's not something that you're going to learn in Yemen. That's not something you're going to learn in Egypt. That's not something you're going to learn in Mauritania. That's not something you're going to learn in any part of the Arab world. Your concentration, your tachassus, your specification is Islamic sciences. Your specification are, is Islamic sciences. Fundraising, you know, uh, marriage counseling, family counseling, you know, all of those things. You don't learn that in those universities. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. I don't know if this is a new revelation or something, but you don't learn that there. If you are fortunate enough as an imam to return home and, and, you know, invest in furthering your education when you return home by, you know, going to enrolling in some college courses, you know, such as what I did and many other imams did. They saw that they were deficient in certain areas or they were not proficient in certain areas and they have to compensate for that. By enrolling in some college courses and gaining some additional information that will be complementary to what they're doing in, in, in terms of their, you know, their leadership. But we need to debunk this myth that when you graduate from the university that you are, you know, a one stop shop. It doesn't work like that. 
You don't graduate from the Islamic university with a degree in hadith or Quran or any other Islamic science and that automatically qualifies you in you know, other social sciences. It doesn't work like that. When some of the women in the early Muslim community came to the Prophet ﷺ to complain that the men were taking up all of his time and absorbing all of his knowledge, he responded to their demands for inclusivity. They were asking to be included. The women came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, all of the men are making off with all of your time. They're asking you all these questions. They hold you up all day long, hold you hostage all day long. You don't make any time for the women in the community. You don't make any time for the women in the community. And the solution was not more time. The Prophet ﷺ had the same 24 hours in a day that we had. So when the women came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, the men are taking up all of your time. You have no time for us, the women in the community. They're holding you hostage all day long, asking you questions, absorbing all of your knowledge. The solution to that was not for the Prophet Sallallahu to supplicate to Allah to give him more time. What was the solution to that? The Prophet Sallallahu had the same 24 hours in a day that we did. So if the women said, you're not giving us enough time, what's the solution to that? Was that the solution to find more time? Or was the solution to manage the time that he had a little bit better where it included the women? You, you follow what I'm saying? The goal was not for him to find more time. The goal was for him to manage the time he already has. If the women came to him and said, the men are taking up all of your time. You have no time for us as women in the community. His solution to that was time management. To manage his time a little bit better, whereby he can include the women in what he's doing. And that's exactly what he did. He didn't ask for more time. He worked smarter, not harder. You understand? He worked smarter, not harder. The goal, if somebody tells you that you're not making enough time, it's not that, oh, well, I don't have enough time. No, you have enough time. You just have to manage your time properly. So the solution was not more time, but to manage the time that he had while including the needs of the women in it. So he instructed the women to choose a day and a time where he could come to them and teach them about the religion. And they complied with that. Right. Exactly. Women are not a priority in our communities until it's time to get married. Women are not a priority in our communities, because many masajid are just boys clubs, right? The women are not a priority until they are a priority. They're not a priority until a brother comes along and wants to get married. Then the women become a priority. But before that, the women are not a priority. And it was based upon this hadith that when I was the imam in South Philadelphia, Wednesday was our sister's class, every Wednesday. From the time that I started until the time that I left, the entire three years that I was the imam there, there was always a woman's class on, th on Wednesday, every Wednesday. It could be raining, it could be sleet, it could be snowing, it could be whatever, hailing, the women showed up. Because they felt like they were prioritized in the community. There were times when it was raining extremely hard. And I would tell, you know, Sister Aaliyah, Leah Kabir, shout out to Sister Aaliyah. I would tell Sister Aaliyah, you know, cancel the class. Let the sisters know the class is canceled tonight. And she would always say, don't cancel the class. Or, or her sister, Naima, uh, she would say, don't cancel the class. Don't cancel the class. The sisters will be here. I promise you they'll be here. And sure enough, after Maghrib comes, we pray Salatul Maghrib, sisters are already pulling up outside. There's nowhere to park because all of the sisters are taking up the parking spaces. It was because of this hadith that we prioritize the women in the community, that we made a day specifically for the women. And we covered the, um, the hadith, the chapter of marriage from Sahih al-Bukhari from beginning to end. The whole entire chapter of marriage, Kitabu Nikah, from Sahih al-Bukhari, from beginning to end.
those CDs are still floating around somewhere. 25 CD set still floating around somewhere. Still floating around somewhere. 25 CDs. I did the same at Masjid Rahma in North New Jersey. We covered the entire chapter of marriage from Sahil Bukhari from beginning to end. Took us a whole entire year. Thursdays. And that, that class wasn't specific for the women, even though the vast majority of the people who were attending were the women. 25 CD set. It's floating around out there somewhere. I don't have it, but somebody has it. All you got to do is ask around. So the leadership deficit that we are experiencing uh, in many African-American Muslim communities has forced many women to pursue marriage on their own terms. This is where it now gets a little daunting. Because of this leadership deficit, women start to see that they are not prioritized in the community and they want to get married. The imam is dragging his feet. You know, the imam's assistant, you know, the imam's assistant is dragging his feet. Nobody seems to prioritize the women. So the women take it upon themselves to go and pursue marriage on their own. This is where it becomes problematic. I mean, but can you blame them? If a sister comes to an imam and says, hey, I'm ready to get married. And he's like, you know, well, you know, give me your info. Give me your, your, your information, inshallah, and we'll see what we can do. A week go by, two weeks go by, three weeks go by, a month goes by. She comes back to the imam, you know, brother imam, you know, I gave you my info, you know, I'm out a month ago. I still haven't heard anything. Have you found any brothers? No, sister, you know, I'll keep my eyes open. Meanwhile, he's not looking. He's not actively looking for her. He's just waiting for something to just kind of fall in his lap. And then he'll make the connection. A brother come to him and say, hey, brother Imam, you know, I'm looking to get married. You know, any, you know, you know, any sisters looking to get married? Oh, by the way, yeah, there is a sister, you know, who gave me her information. That's if he remembers her. That's if he remembers. I'm, I'm telling you from experience. I've seen it happen. The sisters are not prioritized. And so the sister starts to feel like, well, I'm not a priority. So let me go and search for marriage on my own. Now, as, you know, as haram as that might be, I mean, can you blame them? Can you blame them? This is the problem. Can you blame them? Can you blame a sister if she went to the imam multiple times and the imam still doesn't seem like he's even interested in finding someone for her? Can you blame her when she goes and she communicates with a brother, you know, via DM and she starts to communicate with the brother and then comes to the imam and says, hey, I found somebody I'm looking to get married. Or just stop looking altogether. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sister Shahida. Ameen to your dua and, and to your family as well. Jazakallah khair. No, I mean, this is real talk, man. Real talk. And imams know brothers in their community that are looking to get married. They know brothers in the community looking to get married. So the leadership deficit that we are experiencing in many African-American Muslim communities has forced many women to pursue marriage on their own terms. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this has been done by resorting to methods that tend to be a bit unsavory and have undoubtedly proven to be counterproductive to the overall objectives of marriage Islamically. Image is everything. Image is everything. And therefore, Muslim women should never pursue marriage without some semblance of male representation. You should never approach a brother without at least painting a picture to him that you have some men behind you. That you're not just pursuing marriage on your own, that you do have a wali. And you have to lead with that. Even if you don't have a wali. You have an imam of your masjid. And by default, if you don't have a wali from your family, he becomes your imam. He becomes your wali. 
So you, what I'm saying to sisters is that you never want to lead. You never want to lead by making a brother think that you do not have a man in your corner. You understand? You never want a brother to believe that you are pursuing him all by yourself. And there's no man, you know, in your corner. And this is especially true in communities where women who choose to pursue marriage on their own are seen as prey by men who have no intention on respecting the rights and guidelines of the marital process instituted by the religion. You have some men who don't care about halal and haram. You have some men who do not care about what is halal and what is haram. You have some men who are not interested in a long-term marriage. They're not interested in a long-term marriage. They're interested in any woman who will agree to marry them on their terms. And, you know, and he's going to get in and get out. I'm telling you. You have some men and they'll play the Islamic role all the way to the end. Inshallah, mashallah, you know, my sheikh or my imam and blah, 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 blah. To the end of it. They'll, they'll, they'll show up with the mask on. They'll show up with the mask on. And they're not interested in abiding by the Islamic guidelines for marriage. They're interested in any woman who will agree to marry them on their terms. In addition, women who lack male representation in communities where personal accountability is non-existent, right, are likely to become targets of predatory behavior, sometimes even from the leadership of the masjid. Sometimes from the imam himself. Because the imam, in many instances, is untouchable. He can do no wrong in the eyes of the community. We have that same thing that Christians have in the Christian community. <laughs> in the Christian community, the pastor, the preacher, he can do no wrong. Meanwhile, he done wrong so many people in his congregation, but he has reached heights in his notoriety and his respect amongst the community, amongst his congregation, that no matter what is said against him, it will be brushed off. It will be brushed off like it never even happened. As a matter of fact, the people of the congregation will be looking at you as the woman who brings up the complaint. They will be looking at you as the problem. She's trying to bring down our imam. She's trying to hurt the imam. You know, because, you know, some people reach, you know, that level in their notoriety and in that in, in their in their recognition, you know, and no matter what is said against them. You know, it'll be brushed under the, you know, it'll be brushed under the prayer rug as if it didn't happen. This is a very dangerous person because this person usually operates with predatory behavior and they take advantage of sister after sister after sister. And the community knows it. The community knows it right now. They're imams right now that are imams of masjids. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm not going to say any names. I know if the shoe was on the other foot, they would never waste a moment to throw my name out there. But alhamdulillah, we cut from different cloths and I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go out like that. But trust and believe if, if, you know, if the shoe was on the other foot and it was me on that end, trust and believe you wouldn't, you wouldn't waste, you wouldn't waste a moment to throw my name out there. But there are imams right now, <laughs> imams right now. That have been publicly accused of sleeping with this one or sleeping with that one. And we still show up at the chutbah. We still show up at the conference. We still show up at the lecture and listen, you know, at, at, you know, intently. You know, we, we, we listen with both ears and taking notes and mashallah and praising the person, right? Meanwhile, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Inna Allah la yaghdab idha mudiha. Al Fasik, that Allah gets angry when a sinful, immoral person is praised in public. We praise the person in public. Meanwhile, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets angry when this person is praised 
because the person shouldn't be praised. The person should be condemned. And rather than condemning them, we praise them because we live in such an inverted society that right is wrong and wrong is right. And the lines have been blurred between morality, what is morally wrong and morally right. We got an excuse and justification for anybody that we are fond of. And the person that we don't like, we throw the book at them. <laughs> but the person that we're fond of, mashallah, we'll, we'll, we become believers who look for 70 excuses for them. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Proceeds to sip coffee on that one. That's the hypocrisy of the Muslim community. And it's not just the Muslim community. All religious communities do this. All religious communities do this. They're guilty of it. But I'm not speaking to all religious communities. I'm speaking to one in particular, and that is the Muslim community. I'm speaking to the Muslim community in particular. I've heard that it is better to keep our bad laundry quiet to avoid Islamophobic attacks. Not when the behavior is predatory. That's one of the times when exposing the person. See, the problem in the Muslim community is we expose people for things that should be dealt with in private. And we deal with things in private that actually need to be exposed in public. Here again, the inverted society where the lines have been blurred between what is morally wrong and morally right. This is the inverted society. We expose in public things that should be handled behind closed doors. And we handle things behind closed doors that should actually be handled in public. Because it becomes a danger. It becomes a hazard to the, the overall community. When the behavior is predatory, that is not something that you can just let slide. Because it, it's this person today, but it could be your daughter tomorrow. And the only time we want to expose it is when it happened to one of ours. But when it happened to somebody else, it's like, oh, we should keep that, you know, keep our dirty laundry tucked away. We shouldn't expose that, blah, blah, blah. But when it happened to your daughter, then it's like, oh, no, we got to let the whole community know. And everybody needs to know this because we need to protect our daughters. And it's just like, yeah, but when it happened to the other sister daughter, you where was all of that energy then? <laughs> Where was all of that energy then when it happened to somebody else's daughter? But when it happens to your daughter, you want to shout from the rooftops. Here again, the inverted society that we live in. This is the inverted society that we live in. Don't kill the messenger. I'm just, I'm just calling it out as I see it. I'm just calling it out as I see it. But image is everything, sisters. The first thing with you DM a brother, the first thing that you need to say is, hey, I'm just reaching out to see if you're interested in marriage because I want to plug you in with my wali. You let him know from the very beginning that you do have male representation. Even though you may not, but image is everything. Sisters who are new converts and reverts to Islam for one reason or another are oftentimes forced by necessity to seek out imams or presumably good brothers with their local within their local Islamic community to assist them with the marriage process. And while this mission may seem unpretentious to many who sit from a place of privilege, the dangers lurking in every step of this process is enough to give any woman pause. Don't you know how dangerous it is for you as a Muslim woman who is especially somebody who's a new convert to Islam? You don't really know anybody. You don't really know anybody in the Muslim community. You have no one to advocate on your behalf if anything happens to you for you to reach out to an imam, especially if you are a pretty decent looking sister. You're a beautiful sister or you got that you got that thing with you. You know how to carry yourself. You, you, you know, and you carry yourself in a way that draws men's attention to you. All right. You, you know what I'm talking about, that appeal. You have that appeal. Maybe you're not that beautiful, but what you lack in beauty, you make up in sex appeal. Sex appeal meaning there's a body language that you carry yourself with. You, there's, there's a certain type of pizzazz that you have You know when you're in the presence of men that you draw men's attention to you. And there are not a lot of sisters in the Muslim community who have that. 
That's a lot of times what sisters develop from Jahiliya, from the pre-Islamic period. You learn how to navigate your way through certain circles by how you carry yourself. And maybe you're not that pretty. But what you lack in prettiness or what you lack in beauty, you make up in sex appeal. And you can you can you can gain any man's attention, you know, given the right circumstance and situation. That's a very dangerous quality, even though that's just part of who you are naturally. Some women don't even try to be like that. It's just part of their character. That's just part of who they are. Or, you know, Allah forbid that you are extremely beautiful. You know, the danger by you knocking on the imam's door or sending the imam an email. Or, you know, you, you coming to the imam's office or making an appointment with the imam. And you are a new convert to Islam and you don't know anybody. You know how dangerous that is? Because all the imam has to do is take one look at you. One look at you. And, you know, God forbid he doesn't actually have a type. He goes for any woman that shows just an inkling of interest in him. You have some men in, in the Muslim community. I've seen that a lot in the Muslim community. Men don't really have a type. Some Muslim men don't actually have a type. And these are the type of guys before they became Muslim, they, they, they never had a relationship with girls. Probably socially awkward, probably you know insecure or whatever their dilemma was. But they were not that guy before Islam. And then they become Muslim and they know that Muslim women can only choose from a certain pool of men and that to be an imam or a student of knowledge or somebody who's in front of the people that gives you an extra advantage. That gives you an extra advantage. And soon as a, soon as a woman shows him any type of attention, any inkling of attention, he's immediately attracted to her. He doesn't have a type. His type is any woman who shows him attention. His type is any woman that will show him some attention. And so by you approaching him saying, hey, I'm looking for marriage. Number one, it shows you are vulnerable. Because in a man's mind, when a woman is looking for marriage, because a woman doesn't usually put herself out there. So if a woman is bold enough to tell any man that, hey, I'm looking for marriage. Number one, it sends the signal that you are vulnerable. How long you been single? I've been single two years, three years, you know. So in the man's mind, it's like, yo, so you've been without a man for two years? Oh, you desperate. You desperate, desperate. And if you come off, if you come off desperate, then that only, you know, that only adds to, you know, the perception that he has. That you're desperate. But what you're looking for in a husband? Oh, I'm looking for a brother who's practicing his dean. Now you sound superficial. So you're vulnerable. You're desperate. You're superficial. You'll take anything. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like to a man, as a woman, you might be talking to a woman and she may not paint you at that as that. But a man who is with predatory tendencies, a man with predatory tendencies, that's exactly how you come off. I'm, I'm just telling you, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take my word for it. You come off desperate. You come off vulnerable. You come off, you know, I'm just looking at, I'm just looking for a brother who's practicing his dean. Well, how soon are you looking to get married? Well, you know, I just, you know, I want to meet a brother, have a sit down and, you know, then I can kind of decide there. So in, in his mind, he's already tallying up what's necessary to bag you. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to approach an imam or to approach a brother, approach someone that you are looking for and, you know, and, and, and kind of convey that you are looking for marriage. Some scholars suggest here. Now I'm going to give you some solutions to this. All right. You guys following me how dangerous this is. And this is more important for somebody who's a new convert to Islam because she doesn't know anybody. She doesn't know the games that can be played behind the scenes. So somebody who's a new Muslim, a new convert to Islam, in their mind, every Muslim is on the up and up. 
Every Muslim is who he or she says they are. That's the dilemma of being a new convert. The dilemma of being a new convert is that you believe as a new Muslim that every Muslim is on the up and up. And every Muslim is who he or she says they are. At least that's what I believed when I first became Muslim. It took me a while to kind of see, you know, sift through and, you know, learn how to navigate and see that people are just as full of, full of crap as they were before I became Muslim. <laughs> took me a while to figure that out. But at the very beginning, I just, you know, you see a brother with a big beard. You're like, oh, man, he looked religious, spiritual. See a sister with all black and the cob on and gloves on. You're like, wow, you know, they look like they serious. They serious to somebody who's a new Muslim. It's like these people look like they serious about their religion. And then, you know, as you begin to grow, you start to see that some of it is real and some of it is just a complete facade. Some of it is real and some of it is a complete facade. OK, so the solution, some scholars suggest that Muslim minorities living in environments that are not governed by Islamic law, i.e., any country in the West. <laughs> Some scholars suggest that Muslim minorities living in environments that are not governed by Islamic law should create committees, <clears throat> should create committees, should create committees or organize themselves in a way that seeks to serve the Muslims in their locality in all capacities of community life, not excluding marriage and divorce. The Prophet ﷺ instructed those who were traveling, even if they were only three in number, to select a leader from amongst them to ensure a more organized approach to their journey, because without law, there will be no order. Did you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that? <laughs> Let me say that again. Let me say this again. Some scholars suggest that Muslim minorities living in environments that are not governed by Islamic law. So you got to understand something. In the books of Fiqh, in the books of Fiqh, Islamic law or Islamic... Uh, 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 Islamic law jurisprudence. When the scholars wrote those books during those times, they wrote those books for people who resided in predominantly Islamically governed societies. That was the usul. That's the foundation. Meaning when scholars issued fatawa or they extracted Islamic rulings from hadith, they did so under the guise that the people that they were talking to were already living in Islamically governed societies. It wasn't until later that scholars started to write or to include in their Islamic uh, fatawa, their Islamic rulings and, and their extractions of Islamic laws and rulings from these texts, it's, it wasn't until generations later that scholars started to include in those Islamic laws and fatawa um, Muslim minorities, what are called in Arabic, aqalliyat al-Muslima. Aqalliyat, Muslim minorities that were living in lands that were not governed by Islamic law. But from the very beginning, the early Muslim scholars did not write there or give their fatawa, give Islamic rulings or lay down Islamic laws for Muslims who were living in non-Muslim uh, non environments because it wasn't something that was common. Most Muslims migrated to Muslim societies or migrated to a place and begin to establish Islamic law and Islamic societies uh, in those localities. It was rare that a person would migrate to a place and become a minority living under majority Christian rule or Jewish, Jewish rule. You, you follow what I'm saying? You guys follow what I'm saying? 
At the, at the beginning, at the early generations of Islam, Muslims did not migrate to places that were where they were minorities. That happened later, years later, generations later, as Islam began to spread to other parts of the world. And more importantly, towards the West. So now here we are, Muslim, American Muslims, more importantly, African American Muslims living in America or living in the UK or living in Canada, where in many instances we are minorities. Some places in the UK, some places in Canada, because they have large influxes of immigrant Muslims who migrate to those places and establish Islam there. They have Islamic law. You can go to court in places in the UK and in places in Canada and you can bring your Islamic, you know, even some places here in America, you know, they will consider that the fact that you're a Muslim and, you know, these are your practices. They will consider that. But in the UK and in Canada on a much larger scale, because there are larger immigrant communities there and they establish Islam in those environments. They don't shy away from the fact that they're Muslim. The UK might be predominantly Pakistani and, and Bangladeshi for the most part. <laughs> Indian, Pakistan, you know, you know, East Asia. <laughs> Pro probably the majority. Probably the majority. Probably more than people who are actually British, born and raised, Caucasian. But these are people who move to these places, migrate to these places, and make Islam a priority. So much so that laws are now being, you know, Islamic rule, rulings and, you know, laws are now being passed that include, you know, Islam and include Muslims in it. Muslims are in, into politics and they're changing, you know, they're, in, you know, enacting laws and enacting, you know, Certain things that are accommodating to the Muslims who live in those environments. Meanwhile, we're still here in America talking about, oh, we don't get involved in politics. All right. To our own detriment. <laughs> to our own detriment. Nonetheless, um, some scholars suggest that Muslim minorities living in environments that are not governed by Islamic law should create committees and organize themselves in a way that seeks to serve the Muslim community in their locality in all capacities of community life, not excluding marriage and divorce. Meaning we have to have committees to govern our affairs for ourselves. And this was a question that was asked this weekend at our conference uh, to Sheikh Mufti Munir. And, you know, he was asked about, you know, why is it that, you know, Muslims, especially amongst the African-Americans, haven't established a committee or an organization of imams and students of knowledge that sit on the board or sit on a committee and, you know, service the community by, you know, either translating or actually issuing fatawa, Islamic rulings based upon what they've studied to help, you know, to help service the community and, you know, make things a little bit more clear. And one of the things that Mufti, Muhammad Mufti Munir mentioned was that uh, he had passed the same idea by other students of knowledge and they didn't feel that they were ready to do this. And so he wanted to take on the task himself rather than waiting for, you know, others to jump on board. And it's coming, it's coming to that time where, you know, we have to learn how to govern ourselves. It, that time has been here for us to govern our own selves. The Prophet wasallam he instructed those who were traveling. There's an authentic hadith. The Prophet wasallam instructed those who are traveling, if they are three in number, that they should select one of them to be the, to be the leader. If the, three people are traveling, one of them should be the leader. The Prophet Sallallahu said that if three of you are traveling, one of you has to be the leader. So that there is a more organized approach, you know, to your journey. 
Because without law, there's no order. There should be law and order. Even if three people are traveling by themselves, one of them should be the leader. And if that's the case, with three people traveling from point A to point B, that they should select one person from amongst them to be the leader so that there's a more organized approach to them getting to their destination. If that's the case, then what about a whole conglomerate of Muslims living in a particular locality and there's no leader from amongst them? If I were to ask you guys right now, those of you who live on the East Coast, West Coast is a lot different from Texas on back to California. From, let's say, Atlanta, Georgia, all the way up to Connecticut. <laughs> From Atlanta all the way up to Connecticut. Who's, who's the leader of the Muslims? If I had to ask you. Who's the leader of the Muslims? Let's, let's start with the African-American Muslim community. Because we are a separate entity. We are definitely a separate entity, without a doubt. And what I mean by we are a separate entity, meaning imams and students of knowledge don't usually involve themselves in matters that are particular to African-Americans for one reason or another. For one reason or another. Some might say, hey, those are issues that are particular to African-Americans. I'm not qualified to speak on those issues. I'm not aware of the details of those issues. You probably need to bring your affairs to somebody who's more proficient in, in answering that. You have some who might say, well, you know, that's not my concern. My concern is my community, which I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I have been saying this for years to the African-Americans. Why are we you know, bypassing the opportunity to care for our communities? Because nobody else is going to do it. Somebody said Imam Siraj. Okay, Imam Siraj, leader in the Muslim community. Yes, he is. I I'm not taking that away from him. Yes, he is. Okay, who else? We can't keep pointing to Imam Siraj. Imam Siraj. Okay, that's easy. Throw that out there. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to get you guys to start thinking on that level. And more importantly, students of knowledge. They will refute you for saying that. I, I'm not worried about somebody refuting me. <laughs> How are you going to refute something that is a reality? <laughs> Imam Siraj is a leader in the African-American Muslim, in the Muslim community. In the Muslim community, not just specifically to the African-Americans, because Imam Siraj has made himself available to all communities and all communities, you know, acknowledge him and recognize him as a leader in that regard. I am not worried about somebody refuting me. You can't refute something that's a fact. That's a cold, hard fact. <laughs> he is a leader in the Muslim community. That's not something that you can deny. And we don't need the stamp of approval from a sheikh overseas to, you know, to solidify that. I don't need anybody's stamp of approval. That's something that you can ask any Muslim, any Muslim. And they will acknowledge that Imam Siraj is a leader in the Muslim community. Imam Siraj has the power to move mountains, especially in places like New York. Imam Siraj with a phone call can move some things around to make certain things happen. That's power. He has power. Make, make no mistake about that. You can, you can underestimate that if you want to. I know. <laughs> I know. And I do regard him as an imam, as a leader in the Muslim community, more importantly in the African-American Muslim community. Leadership is not determined based upon how a person feels about you. Because I feel this way about you doesn't mean that that strips you of your status. Your status is what it is, regardless of how anybody feels about you. Person's personal feelings about you does not strip you of your status. But who is there for someone from Philly who needs justice or help? There are tons. There are tons. There are tons of people in Philly. There are tons of people in Philly who can, with one phone call, can, you know, can move mountains. 
They're there. It's just about pulling our resources together. Nonetheless, the great scholar Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, he said, if a woman does not have a wali from her family, sisters, I want you to listen to this. Imam Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. Here again, from the scholars who came later. From the scholars who came later. Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, he said, if a woman does not have a wali from her family, nor does she live under Islamic rule where there is a Muslim leader who governs her affairs, then there is a legal view from Imam Ahmed that suggests that she be married off by a fair and reputable Muslim man from the community with her permission. You hear that? Now we're talking about solutions to this problem. So what is, uh, what is uh, Ibn Qudama saying here? And he mentioned this in his book al mughni What is he saying here? He said that if a woman does not have a Muslim male representative from her family, she's the only Muslim in her family or none of the Muslim men in her family practice Islam. Nor does she live under Islamic rule where she can go to a Muslim judge or she can go to an imam and you know have them judge in her affair. She does not live under Islamic rule where there's a Muslim leader who governs her affairs. That's, that's most of the women who convert to Islam in our day and time. Then what should she do? He said there is a legal view, meaning there's a fatawa, there's a fatwa. This is Imam Ibn Qudama who's relying on the Islamic fatwa ruling from a previous scholar. This is a scholar benefiting from another scholar. Ibn Qudama benefiting from the legal view of Imam Ahmed that suggests that she should be married off by a fair, meaning a just and reputable Muslim man from her community. So sisters, if you're seeking out a brother to represent you as a wali, number one, he should be just and he should be reputable, meaning he should be reputable, meaning he is not known for predatory behavior. He is not known for, you know, taking advantage of women. He's probably married, has children, family man. He is respectable in the community and everybody knows him to be such. And he is just in that he has the Islamic knowledge and the wherewithal to assist you in your, in, in your journey to get married without his own personal biases. Without being overcome by his own personal biases. So if you can find a brother in the community who is fair and is reputable, then have him represent you and have him marry you off. You do not have to go to the imam of your local masjid. You do not have to go to the imam of your local masjid. Because in many instances, this brother that you are seeking out is probably just as qualified, if not more qualified than the imam himself. You follow me? Now we're talking about some solutions here. So sisters shouldn't have to feel like you are tied to the imam of your masjid who's dragging his feet, who doesn't seem to make you in your pursuit of marriage a priority. You understand? We're removing the shackles now. You are not hinged. <laughs> You're not tethered to the imam of your masjid waiting for him to you know, graciously you know, carve you out some time to, to help you get married. But you need representation. You have to have male representation. You guys, you guys follow me? Am I, am I making sense here? Does this make sense? Does this give you some room to breathe? Does this help you to take off the chains and the shackles that you've had tied around your arm that was connected to the imam of your masjid? You know, sitting around waiting for him to decide your fate. And there's still some of you listening right now and say, well, I'm going to just wait for my imam. Well, you let me know how that works out for you. You're going to wait for your imam. You let me know how that works out for you, inshallah. So let's go. Uh, 
Let's go a step further. We need a list. How does a new Shahada find that representation? That's just as hard as finding a husband. Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, just asking around, you know, who's who, you know, it might take some time for her to narrow it down to maybe two or three brothers that she can, you know, that she can go to to help represent her. It just takes some time. I mean, just like anything else, taking like searching for a house, you move into and you're looking for a house in a particular neighborhood. You know, you're, you know, the Arabs, they have a saying, a, a, a jar, a couple of dog, you know, how is that not just as dangerous for a new Shahada? Well, the new Shahada is not going to take Shahada and then immediately go seek out a brother. She's going to ask questions. She's going to ask questions. She's going to start with her imam. She's going to start with the imam. Imam, I know you're busy or if you don't have enough time, can you direct me to, you know, a couple of brothers who may be able to assist me in the process? He might say, check out brother so-and-so, brother so-and-so. Then before she goes to brother so-and-so and so-and-so, she's going to go to some of the sisters in the community. Do you know about this brother here? Do you know about that brother here? She's going to do her own research. It's not hard to do research. Come on, you guys are making this seem like it's impossible. It's dangerous one way or another. My job is not to take away the danger. My job is not to take away the danger. The danger exists simply by, by the fault of the fact that you are a woman trying to navigate your terrain that is, you know, navigate a terrain that is usually dominated by men. That within itself makes it dangerous. So my job is not to take away the danger. The danger exists. And this is why as a woman, you have to use your intuition that God gave you. You have to use your spiritual lens. You, there are a number of tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you that you have to use. You can't just put that, you know, put your intellect, you know, to the side and go into it blindly. You know, you still have to use your intellect. You still have to use your intuition. You still have to use your Islamic knowledge. Those are all tools that you're going to use to filter. You understand? But the danger, I can't take away the danger. The danger still exists. My job is not to remove the danger. The danger exists, period. And there's nobody that can take that away. It's still a dangerous process. But that doesn't stop many sisters from going online and registering, you know, on these uh, matrimonial sites. That's even more dangerous than dealing with hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat where you're on the ground searching for reputable rep representation. But that doesn't stop many sisters from going and putting a whole entire profile together and posting it on some matrimonial site. That's more dangerous <laughs> because you're giving the world access to you. Even a man who is not Muslim, who could pose as a Muslim and create a profile and go onto a matrimonial site. You could be talking to a guy who's not even Muslim. At least when your boots are on the ground and you're doing the groundwork at the masjid or at this community or that community, you are, you know what I'm saying, like you're seeing this and you're engaging this firsthand. So the danger is there. My job is not to remove the danger. My job is to give you some tools to help you navigate your situation a little better. Um, if the brother is married, should I make an appointment to speak with both to ask her husband to be my wali? Um, uh, if you are going to ask um, a brother who is married, I think you need to start with his wife first. Because when you ask him to represent you, he's essentially going to ask his wife anyway. So if you know his wife, it might be a good idea for you to say, you know, hey, I'm not interested in your husband, but I am interested in getting married. How would you feel about your husband, you know, kind of helping me through this process? Are you OK with that? This is especially if you know the sister. Now, if you don't know the sister, then that's his responsibility to ask his wife if she's comfortable with him representing you. That, that's his responsibility. But if you know the sister and you pray next to her, you see her at Jumu'ah, you should ask her, hey, you know, I'm looking to get married. 
I listened to, you know, Imam Shadi's lecture last night. Your husband, you know, you, you, you seem like he's a good dude. He takes care of his family. I'm not, let me lead with this. I'm not interested in your husband. Uh, and I would never, you know, even entertain that. But I would like some representation. So if I find a brother, do you think that your husband could help, you know, facilitate that situation? Do you feel that your husband is competent enough, you know, to be able to do that? If, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, I totally respect your decision. You understand? So if you know the sister, then don't go behind her back and go talk to her husband and, and X her out of the equation. No, if you know her, then you go directly to her. Hey, you know, do you, how would you feel if, you know, your husband represented me, you know, in helping me through the marriage process? I don't need his number. He don't need to talk to me personally. Only to conduct the sit downs between me and the brother until we get married. To give his honest opinion, you know, he don't he don't need my number. I don't need his number. But, you know, in order to arrange these situations for us, you know, and she can be the liaison between them as a protection for her husband. You understand? Now, if she doesn't know who the wife is and she knows the brother, then she can reach out to the brother and say, hey, you know, I don't know how you feel about it. But can you ask your wife if she's OK or she's comfortable with you representing me? You know, I don't want to break up nobody's house. I don't want to, you know, involve you in something that your wife would be uncomfortable with. But I would need your wife's consent before, you know, we move forward with this. You know, what I mean, just just being on the up and up, just being honorable about it. You're right, respectfully. Right. So it's it's a matter of respect. All right. So I'll leave with this last point. Um, Imam al Qurtubi, Imam al Qurtubi, another scholar, he said, if a Muslim woman lives in an environment, I want you guys to listen to this. Imam Qurtubi, he said that if a Muslim woman lives in an environment where there is no Islamic leadership, nor does she have a wali from her family, nor does she have a wali from her family, then she should turn her affairs over to someone who is reputable, reliable, and trustworthy from the men in her community. He should assume the role of her wali in this particular instance and marry her off. People should not be denied the experience of marriage simply because the process is complicated by the absence of one of its conditions. Thus, we should ensure their access to marriage in the best way possible. And this was mentioned by Imam Qurtubi, one of the earlier scholars in his uh, famous tafsir, Jamil Ahkam al-Quran. Jamil Ahkam al-Quran. There don't seem to be many brothers willing to act as a wali. What are you basing that on? You're basing that on your limited experiences or are you just throwing that out there because you've lost all hope? <laughs> like, what are you basing that on? There are tons of brothers out there that will assist. There's tons of brothers out there that will assist. But the reason why many brothers may have possibly been apprehensive about assisting is because they probably didn't know that this information existed. They probably didn't know that it was permissible. They probably thought that it was the imam's responsibility to, you know, assume this role. I'm telling you, we are breaking some generational curses here by just this information right here. We're breaking generational curses. Many brothers may not have even known that it was permissible for them to help a sister, you know, and represent her to get married. They might have thought that this was the imam's responsibility. Okay, so you're basing that off of your limited experience. But I'm telling you, there, there are many brothers who probably didn't even know that this was even allowed. They probably thought that it was the imam's responsibility or someone the imam appoints. But in many instances, the imam is very biased and he's going to appoint someone that he is cool with.
If you find a brother and you are looking for representation, shoot me an email. You found the brother? Don't, I mean, like, I'm not a matchmaker. Like, I've completely stepped out of that realm. We organize, you know, uh, marriage fairs. People don't show up. You got older brothers showing up. Younger sisters showing up. You got brothers showing up 60, 50, 60, 70 years old showing, showing up for the marriage fair. And sisters showing up 25, 26, 27 years old. I, I, I'm, I'm done with the whole matchmaking thing. I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. But if you find a brother that you are interested in and you are looking for someone to conduct your sit downs and help you through the marital process, by all means, shoot me an email. Some brothers don't want to be Wali because the sisters don't listen to the brother's opinion and suggestions. That's that's not we're dealing with grown people here. The brother who is representing the sister, he has two options. You can say to the sister, I don't think that this is a good idea. And the sister can say, well, I still want to marry him. OK, I gave you my honest opinion. If you choose to go ahead with that, then you go ahead. Or the brother can say, based upon what I see here, I don't feel comfortable marrying you guys. I, you know, I'm going to send you off to the imam or someone else, but I don't feel comfortable marrying you. But it's not your job as a wali to force the woman. Did, 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 did we not read the hadith where the Prophet Wasallam said that the woman who is a matron who has been married before has more right to decide who she wants to marry than her wali? Did we not cover that hadith? We covered that hadith. A woman who has been married before has every right to decide who she wants to marry, more so than her wali. The wali doesn't have any authority over her except to marry her off or to decide, I don't want no parts of this. You, you guys need to find somebody else to marry you. But the whole idea of, you know, brothers don't want to be walis because the sisters don't listen to them. That's not their job. Your advice is just that. It's advice. It's advice. She's a grown woman. <laughs> At the end of the day, she's not your child. She's not your child. She doesn't have to take your advice. She doesn't have to listen to you. When the Prophet ﷺ told the woman to take your husband, go back to your husband, she asked the Prophet ﷺ, do I have a choice or are you commanding me? Or do I have a choice? Are you commanding me? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I'm just giving you sincere advice. And she said, I choose not to go back to my husband. I don't want to be married to him. I don't want to be married to him. And this was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophetic advice. <laughs> this was prophetic advice. And the woman said, I have no desire to go back to my husband. I have heard that there have been some brothers who act as wali, but then approach the sister for themselves. Let me let me let me let me make myself clear when I'm saying wali or representation. I am not talking about the brother finding somebody for the sister. Because in many instances that don't that doesn't usually work. I'm talking about the sister who has found someone already and just need someone to act as a liaison or someone to act as a chaperone to see her through the marital process. You understand? I'm not talking about a sister going to a brother saying, I'm looking for marriage. Can you help me? And him going out searching for people. For, um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a sister finding the brother that she is interested in and needs representation. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm clear. Don't come to me and say, Brother Imam, I'm looking for a husband. And I'm going to say, um, I'll keep my eyes open. But you are one of many sisters who have approached me. Like It's hard for me to make you a priority. But now if you find someone and you come to me and you say, Brother Imam, I found a brother. Can you, you know, represent me in this situation? Can you sit down with me in this brother and give me your honest opinion about the brother? You understand? That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about. 
You found a brother already and you need that brother vetted from a man's perspective. And so you come to me and you say, brother Imam, I found a brother. Can you, do you mind sitting down with me and the brother so that you can vet him and that you can give me your honest opinion about this situation? In that situation, I will say to you, yes, give me a time, give me a day. We can meet on Zoom. We can meet in person. And I'll sit with you guys for the first sit down. I'll give you my honest opinion. I'll give him my honest opinion. And then we can go from wherever you want to go from there. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you coming to me saying, can you find me a husband? That's a whole nother conversation. That's a whole other conversation. What I'm talking about is that you already found someone and you need him vetted. That's what I'm talking about. For me to sit with you and for me to hear both of you out and for me to give you my honest opinion about whether or not you should go ahead with this situation or you shouldn't. You understand? How to deal with a sibling brother who is basically scared of taking the role as a wali and he refuses. Um, well, don't put him in a situation. Like if, if he's scared, then leave him and find other representation. We just, we just talked about a solution to that. Or get the brother some help. Say, okay, you don't have to you know, approach this situation by yourself. Maybe the imam can assist you or maybe another brother can assist you in the process. But I'm going to read the statement of Imam al to be one more time, and then we'll end there, inshallah ta'ala. So while I'm there, uh, while I'm getting this last comment together, can we do some basic fundraising tonight? Today is $100 Wednesdays. Every Wednesday, we encourage the community to donate $100 to help with our building pro um, project. So if you have $100 sitting in your account, you're not using, you know, it's going to be there tomorrow. It's going to be the day after. Let me help you invest that. Invest that $100 or $1,000 or $500 or whatever you have that you can donate. Inshallah Ta'ala, donate. Donate that. And let us put it to use, Inshallah Ta'ala. Our PayPal is Rolda Islamic Center of Delaware at gmail.com. That is our uh, email. I'll pin it here. You can use uh, PayPal. You can use Zelle. You can use Cash App. Whatever is easy for you. Today is $100 Wednesdays. If you have $100 to donate, please donate. Donate. You have $500, donate. $1,000, donate. Let's get this building up, running, functioning, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can begin streaming our lives directly from the masjid, inshallah. So I'm going to read the statement of Imam Al-Qurtubi one more time. And while I'm reading that, you guys can look into your accounts to see if you have it to give. If you don't have it to give, then make dua for us. If you don't have it to give. If you have it to give, then bismillah, donate it. And get up tonight at the third of the night and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something that you want based upon the sacrifice that you made for him. Imam al he said that if a Muslim woman lives in an environment where there is no Islamic leadership, nor does she have a wali from her family, then she should turn her affairs over to someone who is reputable, reliable, and trustworthy. Reputable, reliable, and trustworthy. Reputable, he's known in the community as an upright, honorable guy. Reliable, meaning he has the resources to assist you in this process and trustworthy. Someone that you can put your affairs in that person's hand and they will handle it with the right type of care. She should turn her affairs over to someone who is reputable, reliable and trustworthy 
from the men in her community. He should assume the role of her wali in this particular instance and marry her off. He didn't say go out and search for a husband, but marry her off. If she found someone and she brought that person to them and he sees that situation to be a decent situation, then he should marry them off. People should not be denied. People should not be denied uh, the experience of marriage simply because the process is complicated by the absence of one of its conditions. Thus, we should ensure their access to marriage in the best way possible. So either we organize in a way where our affairs are managed by a committee or an organization that seeks to assist sisters in this particular regard, or there's going to be complete anarchy. Sisters are going to be left to kind of fend for themselves and go out and search for a brother. You find a brother, then now you need to find someone who can represent you. Without law, there's no order. Without law, there's no order. So, alhamdulillah, I hope that information was beneficial. So, let's uh, do a little fundraising uh, for the next maybe five, ten minutes, inshallah. Um, so, here again, my job is to put the information out there to help you know, brothers and sisters in these situations that, you know, unfortunately, this situation doesn't look like it's going to be, you know, it's going to get any better. So we need to learn how to navigate the terrain based upon where we are currently. Sitting around hoping and praying that the Muslims get their act together and get more organized and, and you know, get more structured in the way that they approach marriage is, you know, is, you know, wishing on a hope and a prayer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We need people to be more active. We need information. This is why a person would remain unmarried. Either they just don't have the finances. Uh, sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's a lack of representation. There are tons of reasons why people uh, remain unmarried. How does one find someone if she is doing things Islamically? Uh, well, here... Um, here's the next dilemma, and that is where do where does a sister find a brother? Uh, thank you, Sister Aisha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. You put no subject uh, line at PayPal. Inshallah, that was okay. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Jazakallahu khairan. Um, so how does a sister find someone? I mean... Here again, there's no organized approach to finding a spouse. There's no organized approach. So as a result of that, sisters are kind of like left to fend for themselves. You know, you run into a brother at the grocery store. You run into a brother at Walmart. You know, I mean, it's going to take for two people to have to, you know, step into that space to say, hey, you know, I observed you over here. First thing first, are you married? I'm saying this with all due respect. If you're not married, then, you know, are you looking for marriage? You know, and there was a time where a sister never had to approach a brother to ask for marriage. But those times have changed and sisters have to be a little bit more bold, you know, in this day and time. Otherwise, you might see a brother from across the room and you guys catch eyes, eye contact, and you never even know that this brother's looking for marriage while you're looking for marriage. But you were, you know, you know. Too prideful to go over and, and ask the brother anything, you know, and that's that. Or, you know, if, if you have, a, you know, a brother that, you know, you know that you know of, you can always ask the brother, hey, you see that brother over there? Can you go find out if that brother's married and if he's looking for marriage? That way it saves, helps you to save face. You don't have to walk up to him. If you know a brother or if you know someone, you can always go and ask him. It could be a complete stranger. It could be a complete stranger and say, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you ask that? You see that Muslim man right there? Can you ask him? I don't know. That's I'm speaking from my own vantage point. But, you know, a, a man who is oblivious, he doesn't mind. You know, hey, can you go ask that guy over there if he's he's married? 
I don't, I don't want to ask it myself out of you know fear, embarrassment, or shame or whatever. And the guys might say, yeah, I'll, I'll ask. Not a problem. Hey, you know, the young sis over there is, you know, wondering if you are married. And the guy might be like, nah, I'm not married. You know what I mean? Like, it, there's so many ways that you can approach that situation. There's so many ways that you can approach a situation. The person doesn't even have to be Muslim for you, for the person to go over and ask, hey, you know, are you married? Or are you interested in marriage? Only thing that you're trying to find out is if he's married and if he's interested in marriage. I converted to Islam this year. It's been very difficult to learn how to be Muslim, a Muslim woman because I don't have any Muslim friends here, but I enjoy listening to you. Okay, um, I got you. Uh, I can understand how you know being a Muslim and trying to figure it out uh, can be difficult, but where do you live? Where are you located? And perhaps there are some sisters on here right now who are from the same locality that you're from. And all it takes is for us to make a connection. The Cash App is Rolda Islamic Center. Rolda Islamic Center. R-A-W-D-A-H. I posted it. I'll post it again. You're from Atlanta. Where at in Atlanta? Stone Mountain. Uh, where at exactly in Atlanta? There are tons of Muslims in Atlanta. You got to be more specific. Are there any other sisters here from Atlanta that can help the sister out? She says she's a new convert and it's really been hard trying to navigate without knowing anybody. So we're trying to connect the sister with some other sisters from Atlanta, inshallah. She's in Smyrna. Any sisters here from Smyrna, Atlanta? That can connect or link with the sister. Anybody else here from Smyrna or in the in that locality or in that area? At any rate, um, there are sisters in um, Rolda Islamic Center of Delaware. There are sisters from the Atlanta area. Uh, someone says, Tok said, if she can DM me, I can put her in touch with some sisters. Okay, so sister, if you could DM her, if you see the sister's post right here, you can DM her, connect with her, and she'll put you in touch with some sisters from Smyrna. It's literally that simple. No matter where you go in the world, you are connected as a Muslim. I don't care where you go in the world. There's always a Muslim. There's always a masjid. There's always somebody. You're always connected, no matter where you go. You are part of a brotherhood, a sisterhood that expands across the entire globe. Billions of Muslims around the world. No matter where you go, you're good. I don't care where I go. I get off a plane. The first place I'm looking is where is the closest masjid. I go to a shop and, you know, fortunately for me, I can recognize, you know, brothers from Arab descent. You know, I know he's from Egypt. I can hear his lehja. I can hear his, um, you know, I can hear his dialect. I know he's from Egypt. I can hear his dialect. I know he's from Palestine. I can hear his dialect. I know he's from, you know, Sudan. I, I, I can pick it up immediately. Where are you from, brother? From Sudan. I knew you were from Sudan. MashaAllah. Salaamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How you doing? Are you Muslim? Yeah, I'm Muslim. MashaAllah. Where are you from? I'm from the States. I'm from here. I'm from there. Blah. Before you know it. Connect it. That's all it takes is a, a short conversation. You connect it no matter where you go. As a Muslim, you are connected no matter where you go. There are Muslims in every corner of the world, no matter where you go. Google the closest masjid, closest mosque, closest halal restaurant, and there you will find Muslims. Never fails. I think the younger generation does not have a viable system that works to meet each other, other than it seems so ambiguous if masjids uh, around took turns for the singles event. Uh, we've been saying that for years, man. We've been saying that for years, but now it's to the point that even if we arranged a singles event, most of the single people are not going to show up because they have been doing it. You know, they have been doing it on their own for so long. They don't have to show up to a singles event anymore. They have other ways to meet each other. So it's, it's really obsolete at this point. 
Organizing a singles event is really obsolete. But I tell you what, what myself and uh, Yusuf Ustad, Yusuf Jabber, were discussing during our conference this weekend is we are going to arrange a youth event, a youth event uh, somewhere between the ages of 16 and 20. Uh, we want to meet with these young brothers and sisters and to see, pick their brains, see what is, you know, what are some of their problems? What are some of their dilemmas? And, and see if we can get them on the right track when it comes to marriage. I'm noticing a lot of young people are interested in getting married. A lot of young people are interested in getting married. Even my son, you know, 21 years old, just got married recently in, in August, you know, and, you know, alhamdulillah, they and his wife is 19. They are a young couple. They got married. And another brother that I'm, I'm very close with from North, his son, youngest son, just got one of his younger sons just got married. Um, there's another brother from Elizabeth who his son got married. Um, these young people are, are, are getting married. And we want to make sure that, you know, we put we're putting them, pushing them in the right direction. But we are going to cater to the young people to help them get married. Because with the youth, it just seems like people are just like, oh, they're too young. They're not ready to get married. No, they're ready to get married. They're ready to get married. Hassan uh, from Atlanta, that clay couple, Hassan, his son just got married. How do we network to find spouses for our children who may be interested? Brothers and sisters who have sons and daughters, you guys need to connect your children with other people's children. Mufti Munir called me after the conference. <laughs> he called me after the conference. He was like, hey, listen, Shadid, man, your, your son, who's 16, about to be 17, you know, is checking for my daughter. And, you know, he's like, I'm just bringing it to your attention. I'm just letting you know. I said, well, you know, if you want to, you know, you want to counsel him, you want to tutor him, you know, and bring him along, that's fine with me. I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't necessarily think he's ready at this particular moment. But if you want to put him underneath your tutelage and you want to, you know, bring him along and, you know, prepare him for marrying your daughter, I'm all with it. I'm good for it. You know, but here again, you have to make those connections. He called me right after the conference on Sunday. He like, yo, Shadid, I just want to run something by you, man. You know, I, I saw your son in the hallway at the hotel and, you know, he's checking for my daughter, man. And I'm like, hey, listen, you know, these are young people, man. They're ready to get married, man. And we have to be able to facilitate that for them. My oldest son had his first sit down when he was 16. He had his first sit down when he was 16. Alhamdulillah, he didn't marry the sister, but that sister got married. A few years after he, she had to sit down with my son, she married another brother. Young couple. So we have to make sure that we do our part to make, you know, to point them in the right direction. So if you got a son, you got a daughter, 16, 17, 18 years old, what are you waiting for? Find a brother who has sons, you know, find somebody else's son and let them have a sit down. Let them have that experience. Let them have that experience, even if nothing becomes of it. At least they've had that experience. They know what it feels like. They know what the protocol is. And they also understand that the only thing that you will accept in your house is marriage. My sons know the only thing that we accept here in this in this household is marriage. If you ain't if you're not marrying her, then don't ask about her. Don't say, Abby, what's up with the um the young sister right there? You ready to marry? If you ain't ready to get married, then don't ask about her. That's the only thing that we accept in this house, period. Your daughter is 27. Uh, I don't have any sons that in, in that age bracket, but I'm sure some there are some brothers who do. I'm sure there are some brothers who do. Sisters, you got any sons in the 27 year bracket? Well, sisters usually want a, a, a little bit older than them. So 29, 30 year bracket. Any brothers here? 29, 30. You need to see Um Hind, inshallah. <laughs> you know, but I mean, we need to facilitate that for them. But, but we're working on that. 
And hopefully after Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, we're looking to shoot for after Ramadan to do um, this workshop with many of our youth to help prepare them for marriage, inshallah. I'll keep everybody posted. You guys have been great. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan to all of you guys who donated. Please continue to donate so that we can get this project on the way. We need to get this building up. We need to get this building running. We need to get this building functional so that we can begin having our events directly at the masjid, inshallah ta'ala. I don't think that we'll have it ready by Ramadan. Hopefully by the second Eid, Eid al-Adha, which will be roughly in June sometime, inshallah ta'ala, we'll have it ready by then. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Please continue to donate. Please encourage others who have it to donate, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can get this project underway. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.